Everybody, I'm on here live. Anybody on here with me? I'm not going to be able to have like a chat with you, but if you're on here, let's go. Wake up, George. I'm here again. Glad I could learn some more about you. Yep. So, Ed and Curtis, can y'all hear me on here? Am I on? Somebody give me a thumbs up. Come on. We're on here. Let's go. Wake up. Are we on here? We got one minute. 20 seconds already been on here. Anybody got me? All right. I hear you. Hello. There you go. We're doing good. All right. <clears throat> good afternoon. Yeah, thanks. Hey, I got to tell you guys right away. Whatever you post up right now, the best I understand, you guys, is I won't be able to get you until after it's over. And if, you, if you'll type in some kind of question or something, wait till I'm finished and put it in after I download this and show it. Because I think what happens is what goes on live, I don't really get them. But I'm learning more about it. And I'm going to introduce, this is where we are. We're at Tech Talk Tuesday number 184. This is Tech Talk Tuesday, number 184. And also, I always like to give a shout out to our Lord and Savior for coming to earth to um, sacrifice himself for our sins so that we could have everlasting life. And I wanted to share that also. Also, I wanted to tell you guys that this is Blue 5 and I think what we'll do is give a real quick little rundown on the updates with them. I know if you guys follow me or watch me on Facebook or Instagram or even on YouTube, um, I'm, I'm, this is uh, George Bryce Star at YouTube. And what we have done is I have made some runs on it up and down the road. I have not been on the dyno yet. I've been tweaking on the tune. We went over to uh, Moonshine the other day and got a, uh, a sort of a one three, well, 143 generic tune to put in it just so I could crank it up. Hey, Charlie, just so I could crank it up without it chugging smoke. And then I went down the road and loaded it down about half throttle up to about 6,000, half throttle up to about 6,000. I did two laps up and down the road to, to seal the rings up. And so far, I don't have anything. These are the only breathers I have right now. These are the head breathers. And I will put a little spool in here in this little cover. I'm gonna hold up the part that I'm gonna use so you can see. This is the big one I'm gonna use. Hold on tight. Here I come. Sorry to be shaking you around. But this goes on here. This is the wind buster. When I was running this down the road and about 60 or 70 mile an hour, the wind blowing across here was siphoning air and fuel out of here. So it wasn't running real good. It's like running a race car with no hood on it, no hood scoop. So got to have this buster on here to bust up the wind blowing across, across here. So, and then what I will do with the little spools, the little spacers that go in here between here and the throttle body and the heads, I will put little vents to go to ground like an old uh, 67 Nova. Yeah, nice wind buster. Thank you. So that's happening. Um, also, let me give you, a, the, these are the little spacers that go between the heads and the wind buster. And I'm going to drill tap little holes and run hoses off these. Now, listen, they sell these already done, but I don't have any. So I've got to do a little bit myself. That's what I've been doing every day on this thing. When I have an extra minute, I work on it when I can. Uh, let's see. I took the 18-inch wheel off, put a 19 on. I like the way it looks better. That's called an enforcer. And this is blue 5.0. I've got some logos coming for it that will say um, 145. And it will say blue 5.0. And uh, I don't know exactly what all I ordered for it, but we're going to know that it's uh, an ex police bike. And I also wanted to tell you that I do have, I'm going to show you live because I do have the, uh, the lights on here. So when I run it at the drag strip, I can use the, uh, the real blue 5.0 lights, which will be fun to run it at the track. If I'm feeling like I'm getting some good confident runs, <laughs> I might be funny and run the lights down the track. You never know. Uh, but this is a muffled exhaust. It's really big. Burns made this for me and I've got a really big, I don't even know how big it is, but it's huge. Um, I was able to finally get me a nice back rotor on here and, and got the caliper, got all the brakes bled out and I got the front brakes working. Let's go around here right quick and see what else I can share with you. Oh, let's see. 
I'm gonna get into the meat and potatoes of the show in just a minute, but I was just gonna give you a quick update on what we got done here. It is running. I mean, I drove it down the road, made two laps up and down the road, everything's working, transmission, clutch. Clutch is working perfectly. Haven't had it on the dyno or loaded it down hard yet to see how far I'm missing that yet. But um, another thing that, uh, that in our Harley-Davidson world and these engines, this is a dry sump engine. It has a, an oil tank back here in the back under the transmission and the oil pump here pumps oil out of the tank and sends it up the push rods, pumps it through the crankshaft. And then of course it returns back to the sump. And then there's a really nice scavenge stage in the stock oil pump that I use, 2020 uh, year model and higher, newer, and it pumps the oil back to the tank. And there has been an issue with Harleys that I wanna share with you. It's called sumping. I'm gonna sit in this chair and I'm gonna move some stuff around here right quick. Oh, I got me a little beaker. Now, one thing that I've learned over time and I've read it on the internet just like you have, but there are people that say, if you are having oil pump issues or sumping issues, you can go up under the motorcycle after you run it on the dyno, run it down the road or whatever, and you can, drink, you can pull the crank sensor out underneath the bottom of the engine, pull the crank sensor out and catch, put a catch can and drain the oil. And what I did after I ran, ran the tar out of it up and down the road, I drained it out and I was able to recover three and a half ounces out of the sump. So according to everything I've done and learned, the amount of oil that's getting pumped through this engine only left three and a half ounces in the sump, which I call perfectly acceptable. If you're getting more than like six, eight, 10, 12 ounces of oil left in there, your scavenge is not doing a good job on your, on your oil pump. So there are a lot of oil pumps, aftermarket oil pumps, because when, when uh, Harley Davidson came out with this Milwaukee 8 in 2017, they came up with some, I don't think they were really great ideas where they were trying to make a uh, higher pressure oil pump. Maybe they were trying to make it lighter. Maybe they were trying to make it uh, more, less horsepower, draw off the engine, but, but they screwed up bad on the scavenge where they were not getting the oil back in the tank as fast as they were pumping it out. And we were having people run down the road that would hold it at say 3000 RPM and go down the road in high gear for a long time, maybe 20 minutes, and it would end up pumping the oil out of the sump back into, no, excuse me, it was pumping more oil to the sump than was getting recovered out of the sump back to the tank. So we had the sump filling up with oil and it was beating air into it and turned it into like a blender. And of course the engine would run hot and the crankshaft was getting beat up with tons and tons of oil. We would probably have a couple of quarts of oil in here. And then once you'd fill this sump up with oil, the tank didn't have enough oil for the oil pump to sh send to the rock arms, couldn't run the piston jets to cool the bottom of the pistons and it couldn't splash oil on the cylinder wall. So the engine burns up and it was all because the scavenge on the oil pump wasn't good enough. And now 2020, they came up with better than anybody else's pump. In 2020, they came out with a new oil pump that has a better scavenge stage than it has a pressure stage. And there's a lot of people that, uh, that are reading this that don't understand what's happening with this something. And I'm giving you an opinion. This is not the facts as uh, proven by an engineer or some independent or, or dependent laboratory where Harley Davidson's trying to cover their bases and do the best they can with this bad issue they have. But they did six or seven iterations of the oil pump over time, and they finally got it right. And the, the aftermarket companies that make blue pumps, red pumps, green pumps, silver pumps, they had a field day with these Milwaukee 8s because of 100,000 Milwaukee 8s a year they were making, the oil pumps were junk. And if you were very, very lucky, if you were very, very lucky, trying to make it work with what you came with. Some people got away with it. I had a 2017 that just ran great um, with the stock pump. And then other people would come in all the time that were having sumping issues and no one really understood what it was, but it was definitely running hot. You could definitely see where it was starving for oil. But when you would cut the drain plug loose under the, sump, under the crankcase here, a couple of quarts would come out and you say, well, how can that run hot if it's got a couple of cores up there because this is not a 
This is not a wet sump engine. There's only supposed to be two or three ounces in here and a ton of it. It's supposed to be four or five quarts back here in the tank. And the oil pump is supposed to supply all the bearings and all the rocker arms and springs and pistons and the, and the um, piston jets that cool the bottom of the pistons were supposed to be supplied with 40, 50 pounds of oil pressure. And then whatever runs off goes back in the sump and gets scavenged out of the sump back into the tank. And whenever you were putting more supply in, it's just like my checking account for my whole career. I always took more money out than I put in and I was always overdrawn. And when you start sumping, you're overdrawing. You're pulling more oil out of the tank than's going back in the tank. And it looked just like my checking account. I always would call Jackie and say, how come they declined the card? How come are we getting bad checks back? It's because we weren't putting enough back in the bank. We were only taking it out of the bank. And we were flooding the engine with money, 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 but we weren't putting any back in there. So we were running, we were sumping our credit cards. We were sumping our checking account. And it took us a long time to figure that out too, just like it took these guys a long time to figure it out. But it's better now. So I'm using a bone stock 2020 oil pump and cam plate in this, and I am getting all, even at high RPM, we know I rev it all the way up as high as it'll go, I'm still only leaving three and a half ounces in the, in the crankcase. So I'm happy with that. That's a long story, run short. Also, I wanted to tell you guys that um, one thing that, I've, that I said last week, I talked to you a lot about, um, Let's see how I can dip this down. I talked to you a lot about bigger valves, and I, and I did run into some ifs and some buts in my own thinking, not because everybody was pointing me wrong, but I wanted to tell you that, I'm gonna let this, no I'm not, I'm gonna leave it alone. Big valves have their limits, okay? I've got a twin cam head here that is a perfect example. I told Ron at Star Racing one day, it was five, six years ago, I said, let's put big valves in this twin cam. So he cut it out, and he put big valves in it. Now, let me move this a little bit closer. So he cut it out, put big seats in it, cut the exhaust out and put big seats in it. And the valves were too close. They were hitting each other on overlap. So let me try and get this out. And I'm gonna try and hold a couple of valves to show you what I'm talking about. This is an intake, this is an exhaust. And when they were stocked, they were sitting up in the chamber like this. Oh man, I didn't mean to bump that. They were sitting up in the chamber. And the bigger we go, we had to sink it and we had to sink it so they would be far enough apart so that you could open this valve before TDC so that it could start its intake stroke before the piston got to the top. We had to sink the exhaust valve because they were gonna hit each other. And this is called clipping clearance. And what we did to cure clipping clearance by going bigger on the intake, bigger on the exhaust, is we had to keep sinking and sinking and sinking and sinking. And we kept filling in with bigger valves. A couple things happen when you do that. One is you run out of room here. Combustion chamber's too tight, the bore's too small. Then we sunk and sunk, but we got bigger than the bore. So I couldn't use this head, y'all. This head got too big from here to here to bore out, to put a big enough cylinder in it for me to clear because I, I had one goal in mind and that was to put the biggest valves I could. So I put the biggest one that would fit, biggest one that would fit, and Ron had to sink them, sink them, sink them. Another thing that happens, it's no good for that. The more you sink the intake valve, the more short turn radius you run out of because we're getting this closer and closer to the turn. So there's just no short radius here to make the turn. This air comes in on these Harleys pretty much straight in. And before it can get in the cylinder and make any power, it's got to make a turn and go in the cylinder. And we need some area to make a short turn here. So as you come along and build racing heads, we got better and better with it. Like the pro stock heads. I'm going to try and set this over here and let you see. I'm gonna roll this, this head a little bit for you to see what a real short turn radius looks like. On the exhaust, check this out. See how high this short turn is? And it never really turns, it just keeps going up. Up, up, up. 
and the intake. Look at this short turn. This is a really nice short turn here. And if we had sunk this a half inch in here to get a bigger valve in, or sunk it 200 to get a bigger valve in, all we did was move the valve closer to this turn and make it hard to make the turn. So therefore, we handicapped ourselves. Now, I'm gonna put two big valves in here. This is a two 730 intake, 2.730 diameter. And here's one more thing I wanna tell you. Once we got heads that were going fast and we were setting records and winning races and winning and getting low ET, one thing I hated to do was to change this guide. Because when you knock that guide out or press that guide out or do whatever you wanna to do to get this guide out of the head because the valve's wobbling, it's getting worn out. I am so sorry I did that. Come back, please. All right. Let's say I have to knock this guide out and put a new one in. There is very little chance of this guide going back in as true as this one is. And then if you have this ported and machined like we do where it's all you can do in the center of this guide, is if this guide goes in a quarter or a tenth of a degree off, we're gonna be running valves off here, 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 or whatever, because the valve will not be true in this hole. So what we did, and this was back in the day, man, back in 2010 to 2016, where you could actually buy valves. You could buy new ones. I don't know why you can't hardly buy new valves anymore, but it's one of the reasons I retired is because I, I couldn't get pistons, I couldn't get valves. It was hard to get that stuff. It's still pretty hard to get pistons now, and it's pretty hard to get valves now, but what we were doing, we were buying these a tenth, oversize a tenth like if this was a 310 0.310 we'd get us some 0.311s then we'd get some 0.312s no 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 those are one thousandths i am sorry a 310.5 we'd get a 310.6 instead of a 310.6 we get a 310.7 and what that allowed us to do was tighten this up a tenth and when i would give ron a valve that had an oversized stem he would go in with a really nice hone and hone this out and knock out a couple of high spots so we could get our clearance back again. But this valve here has no play. This, this, this guide would need to be honed to run this because this will end up seizing up on us. You want it as tight as you can get it, but you don't want it to transfer material from the, the uh, guide to the stem. This one is a tenth smaller, I believe, yeah. And this one has clearance. And it's hitting the table because it's so long. But I'll show you. And this one, this was almost perfect clearance, but when it started wearing, and I'll tell you why it wears in a minute, we would go to an oversized stem. And this valve is tight. That's one piece of news I want to tell you. So then, when we would put the biggest intake valve we could, and we put the biggest exhaust valve we could, this one is only 2.06. We ran, at the end, we ended up running 2.10, which is only a little bit bigger than this one, but the bigger exhaust valve we ran, the better it would run. Not bigger than the intake, not bigger than anybody else in the world, but what we found with our combination was, and I'll tell you how we found it was, when we have a big pipe, we'd make more power. When we put, go from a 1.8 rocker to a 1.9 rocker, we picked up power. If we added five degrees of duration to the exhaust, we would go make more power. So what I decided to do was to start sneaking up on this. I would order a bigger valve in diameter. I'd get another five thou larger in diameter, a tenth bigger on the stem and then we could make the head back brand new again because I would have good valve clearance here. And I would also have a really nice radius in here to be able to put a good large, I would have a good bore size here for the all the exhaust pressure to d jump out, but a bigger valve made it jump out quicker. And another thing I wanted to tell you that was really cool about these engines back then, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it, but I'm gonna try and move it and hope the camera focuses on it. But I want you to look at this All right, it wants to focus on the head. 
Yep. Well, we're not going to be able to see it, but this is a uh, 60 degree. Not a 45, not a 50, not a 55, but it's a 60. And the reason we ran a 60 was so we could make this hole bigger. And that let more exhaust out. And I'll tell you another way we learned that and found out the hard way is we put a big pipe on here. We put a two and a half pipe on and stepped it to two and five eighths and we stepped it to two and three quarters. And then at the end of the four step pipe, we had a three inch pipe at the end on each cylinder. Then we ended up going to a 2.650 pipe and we ported this out bigger and then it made more power. And then pretty soon we ended up with a two and three quarter primary, 2.75 primary. Our primary, our exhaust primary pipe was as big as this intake valve when we finished. And of course we stepped it up to three inches by the time it got out. And here's, here's what we learned about that. And I, I wanna say this and see what you guys think of this, but um, we had, a, an, we had a, a steel flange on here with a big piece of pipe welded on it and we slipped our pipe over and we had these springs. We had a spring hook welded on the pipe and we had a hole in the bracket on there and we would stretch this on here. And this spring is so tight, I can't even pull it. But I had two of these on each pipe. I had one on the front cylinder and one on the back cylinder. I had three springs, I had them like like 12 o'clock, four o'clock, and like eight o'clock. And when I was on the dyno, and there's videos of me running that dyno on here on YouTube, and when I would floor it wide open, wide open, I could see at peak power, at about 8,500, 9,000, 9,500, I could see this spring getting longer and longer and longer, and the pipe was trying to come off. And I wanna tell you, this funniest part about that is, is this pipe, this ain't no little pipe, man. This pipe was, coming out of the head was 2.625, coming out of the head. And then it would go about a foot, and then we would step it up to two and three quarter. It would go about another foot, and then we'd step it up to three inches. So this pipe was 25, 30 inches long. We tried di every different length, but think about this for a minute. 2.625 opening here, a foot long, another foot of two and 750, and then, a, and then the last foot was three inches. Now, how much pressure will go through this pipe? A pipe that big, how much pressure will go through it? Well, right here, y'all, right here, we had a steel flange bolted on here and I put a little bit of red RTV and let it get kind of tacky and then I put the flange on and bolted on and then the flange had the three spring holes and it had these springs holding the pipe on and the pipe would try and come off at peak power. And then when we put it on solid, we welded the pipe to this Y'all, this RTV right here with the flange bolted to it was blowing the RTV out. You could see where the exhaust was coming out between here and here. And that's with a, a two and five eighths pipe, a two and three quarter pipe, and a three inch pipe. The pressure inside the pipe was so big it was trying to blow out. So people say you gotta have small pipes. They say you gotta do this, you gotta do that. I'm just telling you, man, when you're blowing the gas, if you put a gasket here, it would blow the gasket out. And the pipe was straight, straight pipe. Big. It went a foot, got bigger, got went a foot, got bigger again, and it was still blowing this gasket out. So if you ever want to know, and if you stood behind a bike on the starting line and they put it on the two-step and you were 10 or 15 feet back, it will blow your hat off. Your hat will come off your head. It ain't nitro. This is gasoline. So I just wanted to share that with you, how crazy that was. And then with the when we go back to, um, I was wrong about the, the, the limits on the valve. You want the biggest valve you can get. And you also don't want to cheat yourself out of having too small of an exhaust valve just to get a bigger intake in there because we flow, we measure, we check all the intake stuff in the world and we really kind of let this go. And I got to turn this around to show you. We weren't messing around with the intake. 
This is over five square inches right here. So, I mean, we weren't messing around with intake. We had a lot of intake. But we made more power when we gave it more exhaust, and we started working on what we could learn about our intake to exhaust ratio. I can't tell you the right one because cam timing is all involved in that. Uh, there's a lot of variables there, but I do experiment with the relationship between the in intake and exhaust. There are two different strokes. They're a whole revolution away from each other. They don't really communicate as much as people think they do, in my opinion. But when it's time to get the exhaust out, you need some area to get it out. And it wants a bigger valve, it wants a bigger hole, and it wants a big pipe, in my opinion. Therefore, we're going to put bigger pipes, we're going to run more rocker ratio, we're going to run more lift. We're going to keep chasing this one till we nose over with it, but we haven't yet. The other big limit, the big valve limit, is how much room there is in the chamber. This head has a 5.1 bore, okay? So at 5.1 bore, we can get a big valve in there, and we've got the exhaust valve all the way up against the wall because we wanted to get this a little bit further away from the wall, but the clipping clearance on these two valves is so close that we had to start adjusting when, how early we could open this so it wouldn't run into the exhaust valve, and we had to work on how late we closed the exhaust valve because we were running the exhaust valve into the intake valve, and they were having clipping clearance issues on overlap. So we started learning the hard way to get rid of some overlap so you don't have to run the valves into the pistons and you don't have to run the valves into each other to make big power. I'm gonna move this out of the way. And I'm gonna show you the Milwaukee 8, which is the cylinder head of the day. This is a bone stocker right off the motorcycle, right off the police bike. So you can see what's really happening here. You, as you can see, when you open this valve, oh yeah. By the way, y'all, this is a Hemi. It's a four valve Hemi. The valves are going toward intakes, running towards the intake, running towards the exhaust. The intake runs towards the exhaust. These could end up with, if you open this exhaust valve and leave it open too long, you open this intake valve and you open it too soon, these valves could hit each other. But they're very far apart. They're very far apart this way. It's stock, but look how close they are to the chamber. You can't put a bigger valve in here without running into the chamber. So. We started going with really big bore. So by opening up the bore, we were able to scribe this out, put a big bore on it and lay this chamber wall back, lay this chamber wall back so that there would be unshrouding here so we could put bigger intake valves in it and bigger exhaust valves. It's gonna be a while before we get them in here big enough where they start hitting each other in the middle, but they do. Four valves don't get a free run at all this stuff, y'all. The, the, each valve kind of impedes its own flow a little bit where a, a two valve is kind of uh, like this one intake valve on a two valve head is all by itself and it doesn't really have anybody in its way. The four valve has a neighbor who share, hogs some of the road, shares some of the area, but you gotta get this chamber out of the way. So whenever we put big valves in, we would always lay this back, and then you're gonna end up with a larger combustion chamber. And I read on the internet every day, people are all about 88 cc's, 89 cc's, 90 cc's, 91, 92, 93. And they're trying to figure out some ratio that's gonna tell them the cranking compression. And I'm not that guy, I don't care about that. I want the intake valves to be big enough. I want the chamber to be laid back where they can flow around both of them. And this is, just like I said, this is like a Hemi. You got the valves coming in this way and you got valves coming in this way. But I gotta share with you before we get out of here, you guys. This thing goes down on intake with both intake valves open. It turns around, it comes back up and squeezes it with the valve shut. Then the spark plug lights, two of them, and then it goes back down on the power stroke. Then the exhaust valve opens for the first time. Piston goes to the bottom, turns around, comes back up. The exhaust valve is still open and then when the piston gets to the top, the exhaust valve shut and the intake valves are just starting to open and it starts all over again. And I know I've told you that a hundred times, but I want you to get a visual. There's not a lot of crosstalk going on here with anything going on. Piston's at the top when both intake and exhaust valves are open. There might be a little bit, but think for me one more time. At 118 times a second, there's not a lot of action going on in there as fast as you can imagine it. But 
That's another day, another little story, but I shove so much. I shove so much information into this 30 minutes right there. I shove so much information in here that it was like a five valve head instead of a two valve or a four valve. Anyway, God bless y'all. Thank you so much. Tech Talk 184 is in the books, man. I'm thankful for you guys tuning in. I hope you can see it. And please, after, after I download it and it puts it up on my page, send me some questions, send me some notes, and I will also, Jackie will put this on uh, my Facebook page. Thank you all very much. God bless. Have a great night. See you next Tuesday for 185.